All right. <coughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, before um, before I start, I have a question for the local people here. So, who's actually local here? Let's see. How often is the weather like this? Um, like, like all summer. All summer, but like just two months or like half the year type of thing? Three, three months. Almost four months. Okay. And the rest of the time it's raining, I hope, or something like that. Because <laughs> otherwise, it's not fair. Uh, the rain is a lot. <laughs> is that just, true? Yeah, they just tell people that. So they don't keep <laughs> It's not as rainy as you think. No, it's just, I, I, this morning was just beautiful. Well, I, I, I moved here from somewhere else, so I was like shocked by the amount of sun. <laughs> it keeps the expectation low. Yeah. And then it makes sense. All right. Um, so, so as Anne mentioned, uh, yesterday was really about chip seek, uh, chip seek analysis. Uh, so we went uh, into the ins and outs of, uh, of how to do those types of analysis. Uh, so this morning, the, the, I guess both my module and my lab are really about how to analyze uh, methylation data. Uh, the practical is going to be on whole genome bisulfite sequencing. But in the introduction, I'll talk about other uh, assays to actually measure methylation. Um, so let's uh, let's go right into it. Uh, so the objectives of the module uh, is really, as I just said, uh, to go over the different technologies that are used to measure DNA methylation, uh, have a sense of the strengths and weaknesses, uh, and then the the workflow that we'll go into more detail, both in in the presentation and in the lab, is really uh, uh, bisulfite sequencing. Uh, data analysis, um, so you know you will see some of the challenges. Uh, we'll extract uh, methylation levels from this type of data, uh, and then we'll we'll learn how to, to visualize. Uh, and then on the on the on the DMR is the differentially methylated regions. This is really just going to be an overview. Uh, okay, so just starting from the beginning again to make sure. I'm sure many of you know this, and I know some of you know this better than I do. Uh, but uh, so what is DNA methylation? So yesterday we were talking about histone methylation. Uh, here this is really we're going to be talking about DNA methylation, in particular 5-methyl uh, cytosine uh, methylation. Uh, so it affects uh, you know, the majority of CPGs in the human genome. So this was already discussed a little bit. Um, so the fact that this high level of, um, of methylation on CPGs is going to be associated, we'll, we'll look at this with, with some figures as well, is associated with repression. Um, and then, it, when, but this is mainly in CP-rich uh, regions. Uh, the, the relationship between DNA methylation uh, in other regions is, is and transcription is a little bit more complex. And again, that's why. Uh, this is interesting to, to have assays and to be able to, to, to look at that more carefully. Uh, <clears throat> so on the left side here, you have uh, histone methylation, uh, histone tail methylation, uh, which you, again, uh, yesterday uh, you were looking at different chip C pull downs associated with these types of marks, uh, so antibodies to H3. Well, whether it's methylation or acetylation, uh, it's, it's a modification on histone tails. So yesterday you were looking at ChIP-seq data sets of histone modification. Uh, what we're going to be focusing on now is really DNA methylation on the right side. Um, so whether, uh, so this is really the addition of that uh, methyl group uh, on, on the cytosine uh, to get methyl cytosines. Uh, and this can happen either de novo or, and, and this is part of why methylation is so interesting, uh, it can happen on, on the um, uh, complement strand uh, during replication. Uh, and so this is in the context of maintenance. If you have already uh, methylation during replication, you can uh, maintain that methylation. Uh, so, so why is methylation uh, interesting to study and important? Um, Again, Martin talked about this a little bit yesterday, 
uh, there's a question of cause and effect, but one of the things that's interesting about methylation is really it does have this mitotic inheritance because, again, of this process of adding uh, uh, on the second strand uh, methylation when you have already methylation, so that actually en enables cells dividing to retain methylation, so that's uh, one feature of methylation that's, that's uh, important. And then methylation is known to, to, to uh, play an important role in genomic imprinting, transposable element silencing. Uh, one thing Martin didn't say yesterday when he talked about that and talked about uh, Barbara McClintock is that um, two days ago or three days ago, I think, was her birthday. And, and uh, in honor of her birthday, they called it Transposable Element Day. So I don't know if you guys had a big party for that, but that was, you know, three days ago. <laughs> Uh, and so, so but, but clearly methylation is very important in controlling transposable elements uh, and, and preventing sort of uh, hopping around, uh, especially of some active elements. I mean, in the human genome, there aren't so many, but, uh, but that's still uh, a, a main use, I guess, of methylation. Importance in stem cell differentiation, embryonic development, uh, and also at some level, inflammation and and, and potentially infection. Um, so, so I like this figure because, again, uh, as, a, as an introduction uh, to, to methylation, this is sort of a simplistic view of methylation. But again, to, this is sort of the uh, it's, you know it's, it, this, the real story is more complicated than this. But this gives uh, some of the basic principle uh, of methylation as we understand them. So, at the top, you have. Um, so at the top you have what's happening around genes. Um, so you see that in, in a normal state, uh, you know you expect um, low methylation in the promoter uh, expression, uh, and then uh, methylation in the gene body that actually is preventing abnormal uh, start sites. Uh, so this is what you expect in the normal state in genes uh, around genes that are uh, meant to be expressed. Uh, in cancer, sometimes you have this deregulation both ways in, in uh, you know, uh, high levels of, of methylation in the, promo in the CPG islands that lead to repression, so you no longer have activation of the regular transcript. Uh, and, and sometimes you actually have also the reverse and the, um, the uh, loss of methylation in the gene bodies leading to these aberrant transcripts uh, initiated with it. So this is what's happening within genes, potentially. Uh, and then going back to repetitive sequences and transposon. Uh, again, the normal state is to have high level of methylations in those regions to control and prevent expression of these elements uh, that can lead to, uh, to, to new insertions and, and damage. Um, so again, in cancer, you have, uh, in, in some case, uh, high, uh, high methylation. You lose methylation in these regions, which leads to, again, aberrant transcripts or transposition events in some cases. Uh, there's a nice twist to the, this story in cancer where uh, this, as it turns out, actually might be uh, uh, a feature of, of cancer cell that may be recognizable by immune therapies. So because you have these uh, transposon viral transcripts that get expressed, uh, this is a marker uh, that immune therapies can actually target. To, so even though you know, the, you know, the, the, the default is that this shouldn't be good because uh, it might lead to transposition events, it might actually be uh, a, a tool that we might be able to use. And so this is one area uh, that's quite interesting of research around, uh, around that. Uh, but, uh, but, but we're here to learn not so much about methylation itself, uh, thankfully, because I, I wouldn't have been able to go much further than this. Uh, so we're here to learn about how do we measure uh, methylation and, 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 and how do we analyze data coming out of that. Um, so, so uh, standard approach, so there's really three broad categories of approaches. So you have microarrays, uh, which we're going to cover uh, briefly, enrichment-based methods, so different methods to enrich uh, DNA fragments and then uh, sequence them. 
uh, and then and more whole genome, so, so uh, untargeted approaches with whole genome bisulfite sequencing. So we'll go through that um, uh, in detail. One, one very key principle or, and technology that's actually is being used in many of these assays uh, is bisulfite treatment. Uh, so this is an important concept um, that's going to be important for many of these technologies and leads to many of the analytical challenges downstream. So it's important that, again, uh, that this, this uh, concept is clear. Uh, so, so what bisulfite treatment does is that it actually uh, converts, um, it converts uh, unprotected. Uh, so, so if you have a methylated C, that C is protected from the bisulfite treatment and remains uh, a C, but uh, a cytosine. But uh, unprotected, uh, unmethylated Cs through this bisulfite treatment uh, protocol get converted to, to uracil. Uh, one, one twist on this is that this you know, is going to be happening in a strand-specific manner, uh, so, uh, so you need to take that into account. But, uh, but really, the, the, the main thing is that uh, protected methylated Cs will remain Cs while uh, unmethylated Cs would be, will be converted to, to Us. So another, another way of looking at this, <coughs> so, so you have the protected methyl Cs, uh, which are not converted to uracil, and then following a PCR amplification, these unmethylated Cs will basically become Ts, uh, and, and methylated Cs will, become, will remain Cs. Um, so again, assuming, and, and we'll get to that, but this leads to, to quite a number of challenges uh, in the analysis because, well, I mean, looking at this here looks simple, uh, but but if you think back about how we do the analysis, right, we start from these reads that we get here, we map them on the genome, uh, and then from that, well, like yesterday, we would quantify how many we have in a particular region. Here, the analysis, as, as we'll see, is going to be a bit challenging, and even the mapping step is going to be more challenging because, you know, this no longer fits directly the human genome. We have to have an alignment that's aware of the fact that some C's might be T's and, and so on. And again, uh, we'll have to take care of that in, in, on both strands. But still, if, you know, once we're able to do that, we will be able to extract back uh, the, the, the proportion uh, of, of C's that are methylated. Another, another thing to, to keep in mind before we go into this uh, is that we're doing these experiments on, on pooled cells uh, so, uh, so, so we're talking about different levels of methylation at a given place, right? So it's not like all of the Cs at a particular position are necessarily methylated. Most of the time, we're also going to have a mixture, uh, and what we're going to be measuring is what fractions of Cs are methylated at a particular position. Uh, but this bisulfite treatment uh, um, technique is, is really the basis of many of the, of the assays that we're going to be uh, talking about. Um, so, so let's jump right into it. So thinking about bisulfite microarrays uh, as, as a first uh, way, so um, I mean this involves preparing the DNA, doing this bisulfite uh, conversion, and, and I don't have like more slides on, on how this works, but you can imagine that, uh, so it's a hybridization on the microarray. So it basically, the microarray has probe, uh, you know, for, uh, you know, situation of a, a methylated C versus an unmethylated C, and then it just measures the ratio between these different probes. So you basically have, this is an example down here where uh, these Cs are methylated, um, so it leads to this sequence, so you could have a probe associated with that sequence and you're basically measuring that, uh, that probe versus uh, an unmethylated probe that would, that would have these Cs converted to, to Us and then to Ts, right? So, but you can see how, <clears throat> especially if you have just one C, that's relatively simple. If you have multiple 
uh, potential methylated seas in the neighborhood. Then you have uh, to design your probes carefully to be able to, to detect the different types of scenarios. Um, <clears throat> so I'm starting with Illumina 450K. Uh, you know, there were at micro rays even before that, 27K, 450K. Uh, now the methylation epic array also from Illumina basically looks at 850,000 uh, CPGs uh, and then has probes for the unmethylated version and the methylated version. And then it's able to assess the, 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 the state based on, on which probe hybridizes better, basically, or which the, the, the lights up better. Um, so, so here's a figure from, from a, a relatively old paper, but it's nice because, it, it, as you'll see, it shows side-by-side uh, -side the different technologies. Um, so this, uh, this is an older array uh, that's looking at uh, only 20, 27,000 CPGs. So that one is not very dense because, so this plot, uh, you saw a little bit the UCSC browser yesterday. So this is a plot from the UCSC browser. It's looking at a particular region, I guess the Hawks cluster. Uh, so you see that, you know, here you've got quite a number of CPGs and they tend to cluster, uh, you know, as islands in terms of even more dense regions with CPGs. So these are labeled uh, now in red. So there's lots and lots of CPGs in the genome. Uh, some of them end up being uh, clustered as was discussed yesterday. So you have a track here that actually uh, highlights where are the CPG islands. Um, and, and, you know, you could argue that those are the most important, but you know, again, it's, there's lots and lots of CPGs that are not uh, in CPG island. The CPG islands, if you, if you look, tend to be found at the, at the uh, promoter of, of genes. Um, but, but again, it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. So what the, the microarrays uh, did, and again, initially using 27,000 probes and, and, and later 850,000, is to profile as much as possible uh, some of them uh, and then get measurements. But you see that the measurements are quite sparse uh, especially with this, these uh, first generation of arrays. Um, so, so really, and, and again, we'll, we'll, we'll get to, to look at how, um, how sparse or not sparse. Uh, yeah? Can you just see where you have um, targets for sequence containing Cs and the sequence containing Ts, so that you compare and combine them? Yes. Right, that's right. So it's, that's right. So it's, such that you get, and then it's a proportion that's going to be converted into that, that ratio. Uh, but it's very similar to genotypes where, you know, you genotyping arrays would be very similar, right? So you have alternative allele and then it's, you're measuring one versus the other. And you have a very short reference? So the probes themselves, I don't remember the length, but yeah, they're relatively short. 50 mers. Yeah, 50 mers. But I think, I mean, this example shows some of the complexities, right? If, I mean, typically methylation comes in clusters, so, so, but you don't have, you know, if you have a region that's dense with CPGs, I don't know the detail, but the probe design must be a bit challenging to be able to assess what's going on. Do you see a single mismatch? The difference in Yeah, so I, again, I think they, I, I don't even know, but I suspect that they just pro, you know, they assume fully methylated or unmethylated in this case. Uh, and there's probably a ratio between those two. Yes? Yeah, so, um, so I am not, you know, like following the latest technology or the, the level. Because I, I think the Mycelopite T20 actually can convert these, you know, these to, like even if they hydroxy like this. Yes. So I don't know whether, if you're looking at particular CPD, that you can say like it's totally methylated or unmethylated or if it's 50% Right. Is there any technology that actually can identify just the only C which is hydroxy methylated? I think there are. There are. There are. So uh, that's right. So there's an old, there's an I, f I forget. I know that there's a there's a there's a variant to the bisulfite treatment that actually allows you to distinguish the hydroxy methylated versus the, the methylated Cs. Uh, but if I 
but then you 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 have to do the two experiments if you want to be able to to really distinguish the two. Uh, so this is yeah a crude just approximation looking at. Uh, I mean, I, since we're on that topic, so again, so here I'm focusing on the on the just the regular uh, five metal C. Uh, there's also and this is a limitation of the arrays. It's not only CPGs that are methylated. It's mostly the CPGs, but you also have other uh, C's that end up being methylated, those will also be missed by in these microarrays because the microarrays are really targeting directly known CPGs that are interesting, right? So you, I mean, this is something actually that we'll get out of the whole genome bisulfite sequencing that, that we wouldn't be getting uh, out of microarrays. Um, well, yeah. So I wonder the uh, what is the efficiency? So, so that's a good question. So we'll get to that a little bit. Uh, absolutely. So depending on how how much you do the treatment, you can either damage the cells too much or not not convert them enough. Uh, so there is that is um, w one thing to watch for in the protocol is the conversion rate and whether uh, and for that it's helpful to have and we were talking about that a little bit yesterday sequences that we know are methylated, uh, fully methylated, or fully unmethylated, and then make sure, you know, whether you're converting those fully or not. So uh, typically, uh, those are important quality metrics to look at, is the conversion rate at, uh, at known site. And again, uh, often uh, you, you spike in sequences that you know are not methylated, or that you know are methylated, and you can use those to really uh, make those measurements. Um, <clears throat> all right. Um, sure, sure. Uh, what is the Above. I think this is. I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but I think even calling CPG islands, you've got some parameters of what you call a CPG island. So this must be just in terms of density, some, some parameter around that, but I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, predicted exhibits a combined epigenetic score. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. There, I didn't understand the beginning. There, well, there. Well, so, so I'll get onto the pros and cons. I think if you have a lot of samples, there is advantages still. Whether it's for RNA seq, I mean not RNA seq, but for profiling expression. Similarly, for microarrays, if you know exactly what you're interested in looking at, you know you're looking at methylation on these genes that are well covered on your array, uh, and you have a hundred samples. Um, you know, you might still be better off doing microarray experiment because, um, well, number one, the, and that's what I was going to get to, uh, the methods to analyze microarray signal are well established. So you, you know, you you don't have, uh, so whether it's MinFi or RNA beats, there's lots of tools that have been tested and the normalization and all of that has been worked out quite well. Um, so the analysis at some level of, of microarray data. Uh, is uh, slightly uh, easier, and the cost is, is also is, is much better because there, there's a big. Well, we'll get to that, but there's a big difference between the cost between microarray and and uh, the unbiased whole genome sequencing, uh, and then you have the enrichment-based methods in the middle. But there's still you know if you have a lot of samples and you know your question, I would argue that microarray, both for methylation and expression, in some cases still is useful. Hello. Um, yeah, I think you guys are stealing all of my punchline for later, but <laughs> yeah. No, no, absolutely. So another thing, I mean, whether it's mouse, human, I mean, for to design a microarray, you need to know the sequence, right? So, uh, so you don't have that in all organisms. So if you're studying that in an organism, mouse, I would think that there is a methylation array, uh, but yeah, that's another limiting factor. 
Okay, so this is uh, this is for for microarray. Um, so so now we move on to some of the uh, enrichment based approaches. Uh, so MedipSeq uh, is is one. Uh, so this is uh, similar to ChipSeq from yesterday in many ways. So you sonicate DNA, you uh, have library preparation. So this one is interesting because it doesn't have the bisulfite treatment. What it does is it, it uses an antibody that recognizes that particular modification. A bit like yesterday, again, you can have an antibody to, uh, to different proteins or to different histone marks. So here you have an antibody that recognizes uh, this particular mark, and then uh, you, you amplify, and then you do high throughput um, sequencing. Uh, so very similar to, uh, to ChIP-seq experiment. Uh, so similarly, another enrichment-based approach, sonic DNA. so this is methyl cat, um, and now the enrichment of, of DNA that you're doing is through targeting this uh, methyl binding domain, uh, domain protein. Uh, so you're targeting uh, a particular uh, protein uh, that is associated with these uh, methylated Cs. Um, so again, yep. That's a good question. I know. Yeah. yeah. What's, what's the problem? When you do the library cut and then you enrich from the five methyl cytoskin, how do you make sure that during the library cut you don't lose the information state? If you have more too laggy, you can do it. So here, I mean, within that, the library. Well, why you don't lose? But you don't have you don't have conversion there, right? Yeah, you don't it's have. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. You just get the enrichment for the library people oh. and then do the library prep after. Okay, I think the confusion is because it says library prep denature enriched and then library application on the slide. Yes. Yeah. So maybe what's the difference between library prep and library application? No, I feel like we're wrong. Oh, it's a good question. No, there's no question. There's no question. No, there's no question. No, there's no question. That's right. So it's just antibody sensitive to to methylated CPGs. So when you do the library prep, you don't do any amplification? Uh, you probably don't. No, you don't reach any amplification when you when you sequence, but you don't. So you just lag me, and then you don't bring the CR. Well, unfortunately, we don't have Martin. So no, no Martin <laughs> can explain this yeah. better. <laughs> But I think what to mention here, if I may, uh, yes, Liam, is that this is a very good technique. However, it is not very sensitive to low CPG density. So if you do genome-wide, although it's a great technique, but certain CPGs, you will be sensitive more to. So it this has some bias to CPG density. So, so when... Now, so basically, this looks like it just calculates the, the, when you fragment something it and then it calculates whether the, there are two or three C's that are methylated or not because it's going to capture some type that anybody's going to find it the worst methylated piece. That's right. That's right. So I know somebody has that, the antibody set with the antibody and I think like when you open the Well, not if you haven't done the enrichment. Not if you haven't done the enrichment. Yeah, oh, okay. So, yeah, that's the difference. Some people do it before. And before I understand. Yeah, yeah. No, but now I think it's something to do with the... I, I forgot, but this is very recent. Yeah. yeah. People are doing it now. Um, I can't remember why, why they do it, but it used to be often. Yeah. Yeah. But, 
But one, one thing that was said that's, I think, very true about the limitation of this is that it's an enrichment, right? So it's not, so if the region is highly methylated, you get higher signal, but it's not, it, depending on the CPG density, as, as you were saying, it's still hard to interpret that it's a bit the result because all you know is that it's enriched. Because it, even if we think about chip seek, you know, it's not really a measure, it's not quantified, right? It's like, there's, there's all sorts of, it's really, it's not the digital measurement of how many of the Cs were methylated at all, right? So it's really just, you know, roughly this region is highly methylated and comes down in your pull down. So that's one of the things uh, that's going to be, make, make this type of data harder to analyze. Um, because chip seek in terms of quantification of peaks, it's really hard to interpret in some case uh, the the height of those peaks, right? It's, as we'll see uh, when we're actually doing the conversion and counting, uh, it's, it's much more quantitative. Um, okay, so a, similar, um, a similar enrichment based, uh, but here uh, at least the library prep comes down later. So I mean, maybe it was a mistake in my, in my other slide, but um, so here uh, the difference is that we're targeting uh, this methyl binding domain protein, uh, and similar, uh, you measure the, the enrichment uh, that you're getting in the different regions. Um, so, uh, uh, I'm coming to the end of the enrichment based approach. So, another one that um, has been quite popular for, for a number of years is our RBS. Uh, so, this starts with a, a digestion by the NSP one restricted enzyme which cuts uh, uh, CP rich, CPG rich region. So this actually also enriches uh, direct or sort of in a semi unbiased manner CPG rich region uh, and then you follow with the bisulfite treatment, the library amplification and the high throughput sequencing. So the fact that you're actually using not just random sonication but a, a restriction enzyme that targets uh, these CPG rich region um, sort of is, is a way of, of enrichment for the sequences that uh, you're, you're interested in. Um, so, so moving on to, to what does the data look like, I think, which actually is going to help uh, visualize and, and put this together. Uh, so at the bottom, um, at the bottom you have what we were looking at before. Uh, the CPGs, the CPG island, the sort of the sparse microarray probes. Again, that's better now, but uh, microarray probes are relatively sparse. Um, you have data here from RRBS, and you see that uh, you are getting, uh, you know, a nice distribution of reads uh, at some level uh, that does follow uh, quite nicely uh, the distribution of, of CPGs in the genome. So you do get uh, some some representation there, um, so you have, um, and then you have the metal cap um, at different levels and the the MEDIP, uh data here. Uh, so here again, you're only getting reads from these two approaches coming from regions that are that are methylated. Uh, you know, you, you have an advantage uh, compared to you know, for instance, here you had a gap. Uh, in the microarrays, uh, you're getting a nice representation saying that you ha have methylation in this region that you were missing, uh, and so on. And you really get, I mean, a, a, in many ways, a nice profile of enrichment um, of methylation. But I, I'll get back to that. The, it's still, the, the, you know, figuring out the, the quantitative aspect uh, is, is a little bit tricky. And um, well, yeah, well, we'll see as we go through the, the slides what I, what I mean by that. Uh, so, again, I'm not putting too much emphasis on, on, on how to analyze these data, and each of those would be a, a topic on their own. Uh, so there are tools specifically sort of adapted to analyze uh, these different types of data. Um, so you know, depending, so some modification, well, <clears throat> some modification of, uh, of, of tools that are principles that were used for CHIP-seq for, uh, to analyze both the media 
uh, and the meta cap data to actually pull out the regions that are uh, that are in, of interest. Um, so, so, what I what I think is is helpful uh, really to think about is really uh, this slide, which shows you know basically where do you get data. Um, so, so if you look, so 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 looking at the amount of coverage that you're getting in different regions of the genome. So if you, we start uh, at the top in the CPG islands, you know, how much coverage do we get in the CPG islands? Uh, you see that um, MedipSeq and MetalCap uh, are, are very, have very good coverage uh, in terms of these, these CPG islands, uh, you know, more so at some level even than, than RRBS, even though RRBS is quite good. Um, this is a bit different for, for the microarray, uh, and this is about the number of probes. And again, this is a bit of an older data, but it is true that most of the coverage on the microarray is also uh, in CPG islands and then promoters. So you see promoters more or less the same. The big difference is uh, looking again sort of at the whole genome and not focusing only on the CPG island. So if, if you're interested in knowing what's happening uh, outside of CPG Island, well, uh, our RBS data will be quite sparse, uh, the array will be quite sparse, uh, and at some level, uh, the enrichment base, although they do have a slightly better coverage uh, outside of just the CPG Island. Um, again, I'll get, I'll get to the, 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 the more detailed pros and cons uh, after I, I, I talk about <coughs> Uh, whole genome by self the last sets of technologies which are sequencing based. So <clears throat> I'm almost done with the sort of technology intro. Um, the, the, the next uh, two uh, technologies are really um, you know, sort of more unbiased in the sense where with whole genome bisulfide sequencing, all you do is uh, isolate the DNA, do the bisulfide treatment, and sequence. Um, so it has the advantage, but disadvantage that are written there. Um, <clears throat> there's a there's a version of, of whole genome bisulfide sequencing uh, that's very similar to what you would do with exome sequencing. So <clears throat> when because when whole genome sequencing was expensive and it still is, uh, exome sequencing be became popular because you would basically uh, prepare DNA and then have capture probes, different types of capture probes that would restrict the DNA fragments that you would sequence. Uh, so you can do something similar, and so this was done for exome sequencing where you had uh, capture probes that would be designed across all the exons, uh, and so you would, uh, you would, the only DNA you would sequence would be the DNA associated with, with coding exons. So similarly, uh, an MC-seq approach uh, and there's different variants of that, uh, can, can capture uh, DNA fragments <coughs> in regions of interest uh, after the, the bisulfide treatment. And so that's one way of, of being a little bit more cost efficient if you know where you want to look. Uh, so in this case, uh, this was you know, basically targeting CPG islands, but also targeting uh, different enhancers defined uh, by, by other ways. Um, so that's, that's one way of reducing the cost. Uh, <clears throat> so there's lots of tools for, for the analysis of this data. And again, this is what we're going to be going into in detail. Uh, I've added, um, so I've added one of the, the, the latest tool for uh, bisulfite sequencing data. And some of this there's some bonus slides that are going to be in the presentation, so that are not in your book, but uh, uh, and that includes a comparison with this this latest tool uh, that's used for whole genome bisulfide sequencing. So again, this is what uh, we're going to go over. Um, so so I'm almost done with the uh, sort of broad introduction. Um, so this is uh, the slide that I had with. Talking about some of the advantages and differences, and differences. Um, so you know, at some level, all of these methods do provide uh, methylation measurements. Although, as I mentioned, the enrichment-based approach are a little bit uh, harder. Um, right, that's what you have here. 
Uh, so the enrichment base are a little bit, you know, again, if you think about the fact that these are mixtures of cell, that you're doing an enrichment, we'll see uh, later that uh, if you have SNPs and variants, it leads to all sorts of differences in these regions. And all of these are sort of combined into providing just like you got so many reads from that region. But it makes the data a bit more challenging to analyze and normalize. Um, so I have, the well, a bit like what we talked about, microarrays, uh, lower cost, but provide accurate measurements, so especially uh, if you know what you're looking at. The example of, of whether you do have a microarray or not, I don't have that on the slide, but I think that was a good point as well. Um, and then, uh, so the last two points, you know, these approaches that are sequencing based uh, provide absolute DNA measurements at the base pair resolution, which is great, but the cost can, can still be a bit expensive. Um, so maybe at this point, I don't know if you guys, before we go into the workflow for, for analysis, I don't know if you guys have more questions on the technologies or the advantage, disadvantage. You're all warmed up and ready to jump into the analysis. Um, okay, so so let's um, let's jump into this. Um, so so starting with with a bit on quality control and pre-processing. So again, this is going to be similar uh, to to what we did um, yesterday, uh, and at some level, I won't go into as much detail as was done, but. Um, as we were saying yesterday, it's very important that you look at your data. Um, were they all sequenced using the same protocol, the same instruments? Um, if there's big differences in read length and you're comparing samples that have been done using different read length, that's going to that's gonna be a bit uh, problematic. Is there technical issues? Um, so, you know, it's, it's really important, as we were saying yesterday, to, to look at the data. Um, so, um, so this is, again, what you did uh, yesterday, and we'll do that in the lab a little bit, just looking at the overall um, quality of the data, uh, of, of the reads that you have, uh, to see if there's anything uh, that's, that's abnormal or, or there are issues. Uh, so uh, we, we talked about, so, so whole genome bisulfide sequencing, um, you know, you, you would expect a relatively smooth uh, distribution overall, uh, no seeds in this case, uh, um, because those would have been converted reads, but again, we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, with RRBS, because you're not, you're selecting the samples that you're getting, you might have a, a little bit more of a, of, of a, a variable distribution. Um, we talked about this yesterday as well. So, um, you know, if you have actually observe some 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 abnormal stuff in the in the distribution of your read, um, you can you can trim the reads in different ways. Um, you know, there's there's we didn't go over that in too much de detail, but there are specific tools that are really can facilitate that. I mean, you don't have to manually go through your FASTQ file and start cutting. So there's trimomatic and different types of reads that can be, uh, the different types of, of trimming tools that can be used uh, using different approaches. Um, I mean, I don't have, again, it's not so common to do trimming except for the end uh, of the reads if you have uh, loss, of, loss of quality. Um, <clears throat> But, you know, in, in the context of uh, methylation and, and now with uh, even beta, better data generated from the, from the sequencer, um, this, this trimming step, um, well, again, unless you, you really see that you have a, a drop in quality. Uh, so this is, um, well, hopefully you don't have to deal with data sets like this. Uh, so again, this is an example where this is, you know, read quality, I mean, the read from the beginning of the read to the end of the read, and then the distribution of read qualities, as you saw yesterday. So you can have criteria to basically just retain reads that are above a particular value. 
Um, but but to be honest, if it's really if your data set really looks like this, um, you know, you, you should ask uh, yourself some questions. I think yeah. because because even if you just retain the good reads, you know, there's um, there was clearly some problem with with either the sample preparation or the the sequencing. But but definitely, I mean, it still might be better than, than not using it at all. But it's good to to take a look at the uh, the underlying data. Um, so we talked a bit yesterday about uh, duplication. Duplication in the context of methylation is going to be, at some level, even more important because we're going to be trying to quantify how many times that we see a methylated C. Um, so. So this is an important slide. Um, so imagine, so if you have a diverse library, so um, lots of starting material, such that all of your reads are really different fragments, uh, you know, you're in, you're in a situation at the top. So that's, that's the best case. That's what you would want. Uh, if you have uh, a low, uh, low, uh, low diversity library and lots of amplification steps, uh, such that you have a lot of basically um, um, such that you have lots of, of identical fragments basically uh, you end up um, basically and here I should say so the amplification takes place after the conversion but you then will still retain these uh, this these misleading or I mean these bases that suggest that there's a methylation uh, but it's going to completely throw off your, your estimates uh, of uh, methylation if you have some fragments that are represented many, many times, if that makes any sense. So, uh, you know, you want to make sure that you, uh, you remove duplicates in, especially in the whole genome bisulfite sequencing data, because otherwise it's really going to throw off all of your estimates of, of methylation, you know, a fragment that you know, was present one time will be, in some case, present multiple times, and that's going to affect your, your score. Um, so, so I thought, so I, I didn't have, um, I didn't have much on the conversion rate that we talked about, uh, but that's, that's another uh, important factor, which I have, I guess, here. But so we talked about the read quality, uh, presence of adapter. So again, that's something that FastQC will report. Um, you know, so if you if you have lots of adapter sequences, again, it's going to lead to to misalignment and, and miscall. Duplicate rates. If duplicate rates are are very high. Well, you're basically uh, losing a lot of sequence or your coverage, which was 20x, might go down to 10x, and that's also going to be problematic in terms of of giving you good rates of, of methylation. And, and conversion rate, actually, if we have time, um, we, we won't do it in the lab itself. But um, so it's important to report on these conversion rates. Uh, and again, usually in the sample preparation of these bisulfite conversion, you have these sequences uh, that, are, um, that, are, uh, that are not methylated. Uh, and, or that are fully methylated, and that allows you to, to estimate the conversion rate. So we won't do that in the lab itself, but I'll, I'll show you where, um, where that data is for, for some other uh, data sets. Um, I thought uh, one thing, and this is one of the, should have a like, bonus slide. So this is a bonus slide, so I need everybody to look up. Uh, otherwise, you'll miss it. But um, So this is, um, this is from the ENCODE. Uh, uh, data uh, portal. So they specify, uh, you know, what are their expectations for, for good whole genome bisulfite sequencing data sets uh, that they want to release. Um, so, so you see that um, well, ideally you have replicates uh, in the same tissue. You want uh, a conversion rate above 98%. So you want most of the Cs to be converted to uh, to T, um, then you want, um, so if you do have replicates, you want that the quantification for sites that are well covered to be high, good correlation uh, at CPGs when you have replicates, 
Uh, it's fine to have either paired end or single end, um, as long as you say which one it is. Uh, and then, uh, you know, there's metadata that needs to be associated, and, and, and you'll cover that quite a bit with David this afternoon. Um, so, but this is more on the technical side. But again, uh, I'm hoping that, that at, at the end of the lab, we'll, we'll take a quick look at some of the ENCODE data sets um, that they've made available. <clears throat> okay, uh, so now to, off to the fun part. So, so far, this is sort of easy background. So, so why is, before we, we start looking at the slides, so why is bisulfite sequence alignment? I already kind of said it, so. I'm sorry? <laughs> right, so it doesn't quite, the reads don't quite match the reference, right? So. Right. Right. That's right. Yes. So, I mean, I remember, I mean, at some level it's true with sequencing reads, DNA reads as well, right? So it's, it, you know, the reads don't perfectly match the reference all the time. There's SNPs, there's different things, sometimes there's repeats, but now with the bisulfite sequence treatment, I mean, all the reads don't match the reference, right? So it's like free for all in terms of, 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 of what you're getting in the read. So it's, it's really not, not such a trivial problem because, and you also, again, you need a method to find where they go very fast. You've got millions of reads, the, the reference is gigantic, and then you've got all of these, so it's, it's I mean, I'm, I'm not the one who wrote that program. I mean, you said it's, it's like, <laughs> It's it's not it's not easy. Yeah. What about like what about the implementation is on to this? Like so if I'm doing this mapping or I think the bisulfide treatment won't change those, right? So ah, so, so I think it's the bisulfide treatment is restricted, but it's I mean even without that it's complicated enough, right? So so here's uh, a, a toy example uh, that, that shows uh, again, what's happening, right? So you've got an example with a methylated, uh, a methylated C, and typically, again, these comes in, in pairs with both sides on both strands, and unmethylated, unmethylated C. So if you denature the DNA, you've got the two uh, DNA strands, single strand, you do the bisulfite treatment, um, and so you see the, the, the methylated C are protected, the other ones are converted to uracil, uh, it's slightly different on the reverse trend, uh, and then you have PCR amplification, converting those uracils back to, to, to Cs, um, and typically, um, so, so this, so, so assuming 100% success rate, and then usually we're, we're close to that with the treatment, um, these are the sequences that, that we're getting. So this is, again, so we expect to be getting these types of sequences, and we need to be able to map back to the reference genome and, and be able to, uh, to, to reassign, right? So, so understand that the mismatch, you know, allow, allow these mismatch of having keys here and understand that this means that this was an unmethylated C. Sorry, I yeah? Now, yeah, so I like, so uh, see, the, see the, you asked, like, uh, somebody asked, like, why you do the, the adaptation Yes. It's just because it's uh, because it's the antibody identifies the CP uh, method in DNA on single strand. Mm. So you actually see the image of the DNA from I see. And then uh, to all like and then um, then you do the adaptive uh, ligation. But people do it before because it, otherwise it's a bit of bias. You know, mm. and, and so you actually do the adaptive ligation before and but you have to make sure the adapters are not mapped mm. you know. So you do the adaptive ligation and I see. Otherwise, otherwise, other way you have to do the other ends and you have to do the adapter and you have to make the double strand to do the adapter. Mm -hmm. And now I see why. why. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually uh, better now. Because yeah. I think the other way. Right, right, right. Good. <laughs> um, okay, so, and 
Back to, to the, the challenge of mapping these reads to the genome and identifying the metallate. So there's, there's three main approaches um, to do this. So wildcard alignment, three-letter alignment, and, and this less common reference-free processing that uh, I'm putting here. Um, so, so again, so, so people try different approaches to try to, to resolve this. So wildcard aligners is to basically say, um, you know, C's can be T's, we don't know exactly. So, so you convert those to a wildcard, uh, which you will allow to match both C's and T's in the alignment step. Uh, or you can modify sort of the penalty metric matrix depending again on how the aligners work, such that mismatch on Cs don't really count as mismatch. So there's a number of tools that, that, that use or implement this approach of basically saying, you know, we don't really know what's going on with those Cs, sometimes they're Ts, let's just, you know, we convert them as wildcard and, and, and allow anything. So my question is, if you didn't have a lot of wildcard instances given read, yeah. it's become very expensive. That's right. So, so, and we'll get to that. Uh, so it's, yeah, the, the tricky part is, as we'll see, is that it's sort of, what happens in the end is, is also sensitive to the density of Cs and CPGs, I guess, at some level. So, I mean, this is going to work well if all you have is just one of these um, Cs in the middle of a very um, information-rich sequence. Uh, but again, so wildcard aligners, so you allow Cs to match with anything. Um, the alternative is, is to convert um, all the Cs into Ts uh, and, and, and vice versa on both strands. Uh, and then basically, uh, <clears throat> instead, basically convert your alphabet to three letters. So uh, your um, you know, they're in the same ways you sort of give up to, to really understand what's going on. Uh, so you, you convert all the C's into T's and then you do this, you pretend as if the genome was, was only a three base uh, genome. Uh, so again, this is uh, a bit technical and well, just to be made, made clear, it's going to get even worse. Uh, but. <laughs> But I mean, I think it's important to understand those those general concepts, and then and then you can forget about them. But mm -hmm. let's try to let's try to understand them first, and then and then forget about them. I mean, ultimately, it's not going to be so important, but um, but it's going to give you a sense of why and, and some of these these challenges. Um, so you know, the the additional complexity that I mentioned. Is, is the fact that you've got, not only is it a population of cells, it's also, you know, sometimes you have two alleles, so it's heterozygous as opposed to being, uh, so, so the two strands, so it's, so, so the, here you have the methylation level that's either at 100% uh, or 50% or 0%, um, and again, from that you're getting these, so this is a toy example, uh, you're getting these reads. Um, so, so the part that's important is, so, and these are miniature reads. I mean, typically reads are much longer, but this is just to give you an idea of, of what's going on. So, so this is your starting point. This is the truth, and these are the reads that you're getting. And, and this, these cartoons try to give you a, a, a visual uh, representation of what is happening. Maybe the three-letter uh, is, is easier to, to begin with, um, so in the, in the tree letter alignment, you, you've converted both the reads and the genome into this three letter alphabet. So there's no more C's. Um, so without C's, uh, what you end up is, is actually losing. So in shaded here are, are reads that came from someplace, but they're now ambiguous because in the three letter world, uh, you have less information, and so you have more ambiguity in terms of where things go. So here, in, in this mode, you end up losing quite a number of reads because you don't know exactly where they go anymore. They could go in lots of places. Uh, so if you look in terms of what you're able to, um, to call, you know, you basically are losing some regions uh, where you did have reads, but you're no longer able to estimate because of that ambiguity uh, of the three 
letter genome. The flip side in the wildcard alignment, where you allow, if you remember, you, you, you allow mapping uh, no matter what, uh, you know, C and this actually allows you to retain uh, more reads, uh, but, but it has this twisted effect and, and of, of like biasing some reads in some places. And I have that explained better on that. But basically, you know, you end up having, uh, this ends up being more conservative where you only retain reads that you're sure about and this ends up, you know, sort of, sort of working, but, but leading to a few weird things too. Uh, so next slide, that explains this better than my blah, blah. Um, so three letters aligner have lower coverage in highly methylated regions because they end up purging. Because in these regions, all of those C's become T's. And so you end up, in some case, uh, losing reads. But again, as the reads get longer, that problem goes away. Um, Wildcat aligners typically have higher genomic coverage, but at a cost of introducing some bias towards increased DNA methylation, because so there's there's a bit of a, a bias that's introduced by these wildcat aligners. So again, I mean, it's not super important, uh, but but at least hopefully it gives you a sense a little bit of what's uh, what's happening. So uh, I mean, typically uh, I think there, there's. A slight, you know, preference for these types of three-letter alignment because they're a bit more conservative, uh, and if you have longer reads, uh, they tend to work well. Yep. Uh, cases, yes. Right? Well, I mean, there's different mm, approaches, but in the simplest approach, you, yeah, you discard them because you're, it's ambiguous, and so you don't know where to count. Uh, Again, I don't know for methylation, for variant calling, sometimes those reads are used and try to, to weight them in different, you know, but, uh, but typically they're discarded just because it's, it's simpler. Because in the example, I think there's a read that should be also discarded. Yeah. Because it's not the yeah. Well, which is also true here, right? Uh, you know, so yeah, maybe it's just, again, an example to show. Maybe it's in practice, in theory, it's a bit longer and it would be, yeah, yeah, it would be. Um, uh, okay, so, so which tools actually implement this type of strategy? So if we think about, um, again, these three-letter alignments. So that means that you have to convert the reference to, to replace the C's by T's. And you also need to convert all of your reads into that, uh, into that alphabet. Um, oops. So, so Bismarck does that where, um, again, the, the, the genome itself is converted. Um, and then so you have two different versions of the genome that you have to map to, and then you have two different versions of the reads that you also have to map to. And so you have to do all of this. So not only do you map one read to one genome, you have to convert the genomes into um, on the positive negative strand. You have to do the same with the reads. You have to do all of these different types of mapping and then resolve where does the read go. Uh, so you have to see whether, you know, in one version of that it's ambiguous or whether in the end there's a clear mapping location. So, so Bismarck implements that uh, type of approach and this is actually what we're going to do in the practical. Uh, oh, yes? It keeps the original sequences while they're on. Yes. But, but a lot of times actually it's the, it's the converted reads that are also interested to, to look at so when you want to see exactly what, what you know what the data looks like uh, uh, but again this is exactly what we're going to be doing in the practical um, so GenVS which is another tool uh, that's a more recent tool that we're currently testing um, is, is also a tree uh, base aligner and the, the big thing with this uh, this tool is if you think about 
Uh, again, all of the steps here, there's a lot of intermediate files and it's actually quite a slow process. Uh, so one of the, the, so even though it's more or less doing the same thing as Bismarck, uh, GemVS does that more efficiently uh, for the most part. Uh, so at least that's what they claim in their paper. Uh, so these are also some of the bonus slides. <laughs> so, uh, but I think they're going to be on the on the on the student website as well. It's just they're not uh, printed out. Um, so you see, uh, you know, well, in a paper, you know, of a new tool, they always say that they're better than other tools. Uh, so they, you know, that's what they do here as well. But but again, we've been testing this, and it seems to be holding up that it does perform well in terms of performance. Uh, so here you just see sort of the CPU, the amount of CPU it takes, the amount of time. So GenVS is 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 very efficient. Um, you, you compare that to Bismarck, one of the first one. Bismarck, um, you know, it takes. I guess more time in terms of hours, uh, and this is for two different coverage of whole genome bisulfite, um, and you know it, it's faster, but it also maps more read. Uh, so this is the the, the amount of uh, bases that are aligned. So it seems to be perfect. You know, be, so it's been implemented in a faster way, and such that you're getting, you know, so GenBS, which is this one. Uh, comparable to BWA meth, uh, which is yesterday you were talking about BWMEM. So BWA, which is the main uh, mapping tool, uh, or the most used mapping tool probably for genomic read, there's a version for methylation. Uh, so, so here, uh, this GenBS uh, performs uh, comparably, or similarly to that tool, in terms of the amount of reads that it maps but does that um, slightly faster. Uh, and, and I have a bit more on, on GenVS later in terms of what it does too. Um, so the last uh, type of, of alignment strategy, or not alignment, but uh, reference-free processing of these reads is actually um, just that. So it's, it's like it bypasses, it tries to bypass the alignment. And, and this is more sort of an aside. Uh, it's not so common, but I thought it'd be interesting to, to talk about this for a second. Um, so this idea of, of not using a reference uh, comes from, again, variant calling and just regular... Uh, 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 how do you do variant calling? Um, so this is... So switch your brain to not methylation, but back to just regular DNA, regular variant calling. So here, um, variant calling, you map the reads. So all of these, this is IGV, which we're going to be using. So all of these are reads that were sequenced that are mapped to the genome. Uh, and, and you have mismatch that are highlighted. So you map the reads to the genome, and it's quite easy to see where there's a variant here because all of the reads have a variant. But what happens if there's a region that has lots and lots of rearrangement or lots of lots of, of mismatch? Uh, you might not be able to map and detect the variant. Um, so uh, sort of an, an alternative approach uh, to, to variant calling um, is, to, is to do reference-free variant calling where you don't map to the reference genome, you just compare reads in two different conditions. So you've got a tumor, you've got a normal. So you just look at your population of reads, forgetting about the human genome, you just look at all your reads, and then you say, well, in this set, uh, I have reads, I have many reads that are different from that set. So again, the details are not so important here, but it's just the, the concept where uh, if mapping is difficult, why even map? You could just compare if, you're, if the ultimate goal is to compare two different conditions, you could compare your reads to your reads and forget about, um, about the genome. So again, this is just um, one tool. Personally, I haven't used it, and I, you know, I don't know if you have, Martin. Uh, yeah? Yes. Yes. 
same way wouldn't align to like the tumor doesn't align to yes. references in the line here. Right. So this would be really if you're suppose you're interested in in abnormal tumor methylation, right? So if you have a, re a normal sample and a tumor sample, you could just look at your methylation reads and say, you know, so most of your reads are going to look the same in the two in the two samples, but you might have a population of reads in your tumor that are very different than your than a population, than, than you don't find. You have a whole bunch of, of tumor reads, methylated tumor reads that you don't have in your other sample. So you identify that, that, that group of reads, and then you say, where did they come from? So you would still use the reference, but sort of downstream. Uh, and so, you know, it might, I, I would think that especially in some of these regions that where mapping was a problem because you have low complexity and things like that, you know, you might see a pattern that you would miss in the other approach because, you know, you, they, they fail that missing step, right? If we go back to... You know, we go back to this. We know that there are some regions that are that are becoming ambiguous, and you can't map. Maybe that's all. We're, you know, maybe you have a hundred times more of those reads in the tumor than you do in the normal. So you know, there might be something there. So it's again, that's 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 the idea um, um, of of this approach. That, that was developed initially in the context of tumors, which is also uh, the genomic sequencing, which is also not that commonly used. Uh, but, but the same principle, in principle, uh, should also apply in methylation. So I'm putting that out there, but this is really uh, sort of an aside. Um, okay, so uh, moving on. So we've talked about alignment, uh, which, as I mentioned, was one of the, the big challenge. Um, but once we've aligned the reads, uh, then we're going to be interested in, in quantifying the le levels of methylation. Um, so, so this is a different uh, cartoon view uh, of what we have. So, <clears throat> so if you look at the top, um, you have the actual uh, methylation level uh, at different uh, CPGs. Uh, then you're going to have after... Um, after uh, mapping, um, you know, your different uh, reads. Um, so here we're not showing the C's and the T's, we're just uh, sort of color coding these. Uh, so you'll have, if you had no methylation, as we've seen, all of these will have been converted. Um, so you end up having uh, a mismatch in this case, but we know how to read, we know that we should read this as uh, as, a, as an unmethylated C, so no methylation. Uh, this is the opposite, where all of these Cs were unconverted. So this is this corresponds to 100% um, convert. So once we've mapped the reads, uh, you know we sh we sh were able to read out these patterns uh, and convert that into a methylation profile. Um, but but maybe this is a good example. To go back to one of the things we were talking about, I mean, this is much more quantitative than than the pull down experiments that would then, you know, just give levels. But here, you know, we're able to really count the number of observation and convert that into a ratio uh, of methylated uh, C's. Yeah. If, for example, we see a T only. Yes. Well, so maybe you're getting uh, into what I have on the next slide. I mean, again, if the reference genome is a C at that position and all you see are Ts, you know, this means that they were all uh, unmethylated at this point. But, you know, but, but maybe you're getting into what I'm, I have on the next slide, which is, yeah, but what if the reference genome is wrong? And that individual has a T at that position. Um, so, so that's, so, I mean, again, this is the nice case, but, um, you know, I don't know if I've already lost you or if I'm going to lose you now, but uh, this is the right place to, to, to get lost, if anywhere. Um, because this is now talking about the fact that so far, we've sort of assumed that the reference was correct when actually there's a million SNPs or more 10 million, I guess, right? Between individuals, usually. One million? 
Depends on the individual. Okay, yeah. well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm weird. I have more than that. Like, if you're in the same ethnic group, you're in the two to four, I would argue. If you're oh, yeah. you know, African, uh, African ancestry, then it's 10. So that's what I'm trying That makes sense. <laughs> so there's lots of SNPs. There's lots of SNPs in the genome, right? There's lots of places where where on top of, of the fact that you've sometimes converted a C or not converted, uh, you've got differences. So this slide uh, is, is to show that a little bit and show a little bit the impact of that. Um, so assume, so on the, on the left side, we have the same types of examples that we had before. So we have a real C, um, right, um, which has a matching G. So here, again, in the context of the bisulfite treatment, um, you know, we expect to get the Cs converted to Ts, and on the reverse strand, to only have the, the G. So this is for a real, uh, a real uh, C in the genome uh, that is converted. Um, if, uh, though, you have um, you know, a SNP such that um, this is our reference, but in that particular individual, what we have is a T at that position, right? Uh, so the T that we're going to see here is mislead. I mean, it's, so it's not the same as this T, right? So again, um, you know, looking, looking at the reference, we're going to say, ah, oh, we see a T here. It's supposed to be a C. You know, there you go. You've got, a, you, you've got an unmethylated C. Uh, so that... Here, we'll, that's what, if we only look there, that's what we're going to think. If we, look on the, if we have sufficient reads, such that we have reads on the reverse strand, though, uh, we, we should see an A in this case, because there's a SNP. And that would change our interpretation to say, this is not a methylated, an unmethylated C. This is actually a SNP. Um, similarly, you can have a reverse type of thing um, that's happening where um, a T uh, is a SNP, such that, you know, you think it's a T there in the reference, but in that individual, it's actually a C. The C gets converted into a T. So again, we're like, oh, well, in this case, we think nothing is happening here. We think nothing is happening because it's a T and it's supposed to be a T in the reference. But actually, it's, if we look again on the, well, so this one is, is a total Confusion, is it? Well, at that point, I'm confused, too. So if we see a G, so this one looks, oh, no, 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 no. So we can still, again, say that there's a problem, that this is an unmethylated C, because, um, because again, compared to the reference, this pattern is not expected, right? We would have expected an A on, on the reverse uh, strand. So, so again, you need to have uh, an algorithm that's aware of these possibilities. Right. So, but I don't think you have to do that because again, you've got if you're using if you have enough coverage and you have the reverse trend, then then you can resolve all of these different cases. So, but it's really based on you need to have sufficient coverage such that you see the reverse trend. And then that allows you, in these cases, to resolve. But it's really a bit of a, a mind exercise, I would say, but uh, to do that. Uh, it's a bit, it's even worse than that if you think about the fact that it's a, it's a rosigous SNP, and then you're going to get a mixture, and then you really have to have enough read depth to be able to resolve all these cases. So again, very happy I'm not the one who had to write the software to, to extract that from the data. Yes? Yeah. Uh, the SNP is, goes in this way, right? So it's when you it's the reference is a C, but it's a T in the reference. So it's so this is the reference, and then so it's it's going in this direction. So this is you don't see this, right? Well, all you see, all you know is the reference, 
and and you get these reads but you can infer what the true genotype is based on those patterns on the two strands that you're getting and but again i mean think about the fact that it's heterozygous i mean it's it's so it's not it's not really not so easy but thankfully other people have worked this out uh, and and my point here was really just to, uh, such that you're aware of this, you know, again, uh, you can imagine that um, depending on, on the, the CPG density, the SNP density, you know, these problems become, uh, become also even more tricky to be able to, to really resolve. And you need, especially for calling SNP like this, you, didn't, you do need to have sufficient coverage to be able, again, to do, have enough observation on both strands. I mean, you... I mean, another thing I didn't even talk about, but you also have sometimes errors, right? So you'll have a read that actually has an error that adds up and that is in there too. So it's not so easy to, uh, to call SNPs. Uh, but again, as I said, there's some, some tools out there that do that. Uh, so this SNP, for instance, uh, that we won't be running in, in this case. I mean, again, if you're interested in this, I, I encourage you to look at, at some of these papers. Uh, but this SNP is one tool that we typically run at the end of this mark uh, to, to call SNPs from this data as well. Um, and maybe this is not so, so critical, this SNP accuracy and so on. Um, so you have that in the slides if you're interested. As I mentioned, I have a few bonus slides. So this is another of the bonus slides uh, coming from uh, the GEMBS paper. Uh, so the GEM, um, BS paper also implements uh, an efficient SNP caller uh, as part of their uh, of their package. So here you have the three different aligners: uh, Bismarck, BSMAP, GEM, GEM3, which is the aligner that's used by GEMBS, and it again plots. It's it's very efficient in terms of of the, the resources and the time it takes. Uh, to call SNPs. Um, again, if we if we trust their their figures, um, you know this is um, what they report in terms of the accuracy of their their SNP calls in this data. Um, so one thing to to point so so in this these plots, you know, it starts with um, well extremely high coverage, right? I mean unrealistic. <laughs> uh, high coverage uh, down to you know 30 you know this even this ends up I mean, you know, for whole genome sequencing is is probably closer to the range um, that that's achievable uh, and then it plots um, you know the, the amount of false negatives and you know, the, the amount that you're missing uh, at these different cutoffs um, so but I mean so the performance is is reasonable but you do have Especially if you only have 18x, 20, you do have some some mistakes, uh, missed calls. Um, you know, one thing that would be interesting, which we don't have here, is a comparison with whole genome sequencing. Whole genome sequencing is much more robust uh, at calling SNPs, but this this also works um, reasonably well. Uh, again, so this is more as a as a nice to have. Uh, we won't be doing that. Uh, in the practical per se. Um, I have a so typically we do the SNP calling at, uh, at the end, which is true, like, like the case that we showed here. Right. That's a good question. Um, I think <coughs> I think the SNP calling takes into input as well the the methylation calls and will change the methylation calls at the same time. But I'm not even sure. So I think. But, but it also takes into account. Sorry, it also takes into account PD SNP. So I think that's what. You're oh, talking. that's right. So so the, the reference is SNP aware. 
the, I guess the bigger question is in terms of personalized genomes. So if you could personalize the genome, if it's the same genome as what you're sequencing, whether it's an organism or a human, how would that improve compatibility? That's kind of an emerging work that's happening now, both within the ENCODE consortium through part of the GTEx program, where they have many different tissues from the same individual. So what power do you get by aligning to a personalized reference, which I think is what you're asking. But in model organisms, of course, you could do that. Like you Castanis example, you could generate that, that um, right. personalized reference. I Well, usually if this is done on an individual, by individual basis, um, actually it would if you were to pool all that data uh, to call the variants, um, which would probably be a good idea because this way you would have sufficient coverage on these to be able to call it well. Um, I guess it would also depend on how distinct that population is from the reference. So I don't, yeah, it depends on how much it's drifting. So, I mean, I think in that case, I think perhaps you know, making a personalizing the reference for that population, so maybe sampling one or two individuals and then you know, incorporating those positions in the reference and then realigning, you might see. Again, it depends on how restricted it is. This is a Greenland population? Yeah, Greenland. Just, just so it's like a Scandinavian population. Yeah. Like, or Inuit. Okay, so in you have to use something But but one point that Martin made that's important and I forgot to mention, but the annotation of DB SNP for these calls is quite important. So most of the variants still are known, the location of where they are. So Annotating the methylation calls using even common genotype is, is an important uh, step. Okay, so moving on to um, to something that we will do um, in the in the lab, uh, as well as data visualization and, and some aspect of, of statistical analysis. Um, so one of the things. Uh, that, that's quite helpful you, with your data once you've aligned it is to look look at it in the browser um, for, for the particular lab that we're going to work on uh, we're, we're going to use IGV which hopefully you've installed on your computer as, as per the instructions um, so we're going to be using IGV and IGV is very nice because it has a dedicated mode to look at uh, methylation data um, such that uh, Again, both in terms of making sure that you've run the pipeline correctly, uh, it's useful to, to look at. And, uh, well, without going into the detail, IGV has a, 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 a display uh, color mode that's uh, methylation data aware, uh, such that you can identify, um, again, uh, visually uh, methylated and unmethylated Cs. Uh, so this is a case where <laughs> you have low methylation in the normal and, and higher uh, methylation in the tumor, which is, um, you know, the kinds of, so going back to the, our starting point, um, an example of uh, one of these cases where you have um, aberrant uh, hypermethylation on the, on the promoter of that gene. Uh, so we'll, we'll do a little bit of that in the lab. Um, another thing uh, that we won't do in the lab, but that's that's uh, helpful, uh, is really to also look at um, the, the global distribution of methylation values uh, and, and doing clustering of samples based on similarity and things like that. Um, so this is uh, exploratory analysis uh, using the methylated regions 
Um, so looking, for instance, at, uh, you know, overall, so once you've actually extracted uh, the, the distribution of methylation values uh, across the different CPGs, um, what's, the, what's the distribution of methylation that you're getting? Uh, you expect the distribution a bit like this, where uh, many CPGs are unmethylated, and then you have, uh, you know, from highly to, to more intermediate methylation levels. Um, this is about, I guess, the, the read coverage showing uh, how many are you actually able to call, because obviously, depending on the amount of reads you have, you're going to be able to estimate that methylation values uh, better or, or worse. Um, so I talked about this um, a little bit uh, when I talked about ENCO, uh, but you're probably going to be interested in uh, correlation. So once again, you have uh, values of various CPGs of methyl different methylation value. Uh, so this would be to look at um, at the correlation between different uh, pairs of samples and depending whether they're replicates of the same thing or um, so I don't remember what what ENCO expected with replicates in terms of correlation above 80 percent or something like that I think um, so again the higher coverage you have the more accurate your uh, methylation levels will be <coughs> And you can sort of play with this. I'm sure that if you have a cutoff where you only take CPGs that have sufficient coverage, then you would actually have a higher uh, correlation between, between replicates and so on. Um, you can do, um, again, so this is all using uh, a toolkit called MetalKit, uh, or you could do that directly in, in R, but there's a lot of, of, of routine that are implemented in, in MetalKit. Um, just again comparing different samples uh, and you know seeing patterns that you would expect or not expect um, based on what uh, what you see um, so I'm, I'm coming towards the end I'll um, so just of the the presentation I think I've been talking for long enough we'll soon actually do something with our hands um, so just to, to, to finish up though, uh, so another important thing that we typically do, so here, I mean, this was more in, in sort of exploratory mode, just to make sure, so just like it's very useful to look at your data at the very beginning, it's also very helpful to look at your data after mapping, um, you know, and after calling methylation values, just to make sure that it looks more or less as you would expect. Uh, before you go into uh, sort of more advanced uh, downstream analysis, like uh, measuring differentially methylated regions. Um, so, so to measure uh, different, so assuming again that, that you were successful in all of the initial steps of mapping and calling uh, methylation variants. <coughs> um, so, so typically something that's interesting to do is to actually identify in two groups or in two conditions, regions that are differentially methylated. And, and you could do that at the level of individual CPGs, especially if you have uh, sequence data and that's quantitative, as we've been looking at. Um, so you can imagine this case where you have different CPGs across the genome uh, and then different levels. Again, in order to be able to identify robustly uh, statistically significant differences, uh, you need, you'll, you'll need replicates. <coughs> and you can either do that at the level of individual CPGs, uh, where you could actually measure, well, what's the, you know, what's the, the assuming some, some kind of distribution, what's the probability of observing uh, three of these with a high level uh, and three with, with low level, uh, and so you, you actually can extract at the level of individual CPGs a uh, significant score uh, for being differentially methylated. Um, so this is in some ways similar to what you would do with gene expression or with other things. Uh, you just have to, to, to model uh, the distribution, your expectation slightly differently. Typically, 
Uh, this is, you can, in theory, you can, you can do it at the level of individual CPGs, uh, but depending on your coverage and how much variability you have at individual CPGs, often this is more done at the level of, of tiling and then looking at regions, or, or either you have fixed size tiles or you have a fixed number of CPGs in a row where you want three CPGs or more to be in a row to be different in the two groups. Um, so, uh, just, so, so again, either fixed size regions or fixed number of CPGs, and then similar type of statistical tests between the two groups to, to identify differences. Uh, you know, it's it's useful and important to have replicates as much as possible because. Um, you know, you can see that sometimes there is actually quite some variability uh, between, so here if you have the three samples in, in red, um, you know, one of those uh, maybe looks a bit like the blue, but you see that there's quite a bit of variability. So, um, you know, it does seem like there's a difference between red and blue in this region, but, um, but again, this, this seems to be uh, quite variable. Uh, th th there is, again, because the coverage of individual CPGs is typically relatively low, uh, the methylation levels can be a bit noisy, uh, but if you use smoothing approaches, uh, you can get much cleaner signal. And that's, uh, you know, and then again, the, the, how meaningful it is to have a single CPG that's differentially methylated is unclear. It's, it's more clear at the level of, of slightly larger regions. And so in this context, uh, smoothing um, is good. <clears throat> um, so, you know, and, and again, the, the, the types of things that you're hoping to detect. So this is uh, a paper that's showing, uh, you know, different cell, different, uh, Different cell state development stage and, and, and cell uh, cell lines uh, methylation level, uh, and you see that in, in development uh, methylation here in these uh, two promoters uh, gets gets lost, such that probably these genes um, get activated at, at that particular uh, cell stage. But again, for this, typically uh, you actually smooth the data and or use tiling windows to actually identify these regions that are differentially methylated based on, on the statistical criteria. Um, so, so I'm almost done. Um, no more bonus slides for you guys. <laughs> um, but but this, this one I think is also important because um, again, oftentimes uh, I guess identifying TMRs, these differentially methylated regions, is really the main reason why you're doing this, right? You have two conditions or, or you're looking at the time course. Uh, and this is showing um, sort of the, the pros and cons of, of having uh, higher depth data to identify these regions that are differentially methylated. Uh, so just going over this quickly, you've got different cell types, uh, <coughs> and you see that the methylation patterns correlate well by cell type. That's what you see on the left side. So this is similar to what we saw before in terms of correlation. Um, the, the plot that's interesting, so this is, you know, there's human ES cells, there's cortex, there's liver, and different types of CD um, of blood cell types. Um, but the, the thing that's um, that's nice is is, uh, is is this plot, for instance, which shows you know how many DMRs can you identify. So first you have the full data uh, at 30x whole genome sequence, uh, but then they sort of downsample that data and ask the question, you know, with less data, are you able to identify differentially methylated region? Uh, and what you see is that. Um, you know, if you start with, with relatively low coverage, 1x to 5x, you identify, you are able to identify regions but that are bigger in the order of a KB and that have a very, very large difference in methylation. 
uh, 40%. Uh, and as you increase coverage, uh, what you're getting is the ability to detect smaller and smaller uh, regions that are differentially methylated and, and smaller effect size. Yes? Well, so, so again, here the, their starting point is really taking full 30x whole genome bisulfite, comparing two different conditions, and using that to define DMRs, right? Um, I mean, the, the more data you have, the more sensitive your windows, the more subtle the, the, the changes are going to be. So it's, there's no good answer. It's, it's, I mean, the, the point of that particular, especially panel, is to say, you know, depending, you know, the, the, the deeper sequencing you have, the more subtle effects and smaller regions you're going to be able to detect. Yeah. Well, so, so that, that's what that's what this is. Yes. Yeah, that's that's. I mean, that's what they've tried. So if you look right at different coverage, you also have some estimates. But the, the problem is, is what's the ground truth, right? You don't have, you know. So so here they're defining the ground truth with replicates and 30x, and that's what they're using. And then they go down to see, you know, with fewer replicates or less coverage, you know, how much would they have found of of that set. I guess it's also uh, quite important how homogeneous your sample is. Yeah. Yes. No, no, absolutely. Um, okay, so any other questions? Um, so hopefully, uh, well, I started. Hopefully, it wasn't so bad the way I described <laughs> it. Uh, VSC analysis is not easy. I think some of the concepts are a little bit tricky when you think about these converted reads, and you'll see that in the lab, you know. Uh, but again, there are tools that, that have been written to do that. Uh, so you have to choose the appropriate DNA methyl methylation technology, and we talked about quite a bit the pros and cons of the different approaches. I uh, need to check and quantify and watch for biases. Again, this is the kind of thing we'll do a bit in the lab. Um, multi-step analysis workflow. Uh, I guess that's that's again what we're going to do in the lab. Um, the the available whole genome bisulfite sequencing data sets. I think if we have time, what I'll do is uh, we'll do a bit of that at the end of the lab. I'll show you both uh, in the portal, but also in the encode um, where where we can find some of these data sets. Um, but I think. 15 minutes early, we'll, we'll start the coffee break. And then, unless Anne disagrees, we'll start again 15 minutes early such that we have more time.